so the kind of format for this session is basically we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the research that we do um, and I'll say a little bit about I guess it's kind of intellectual uh, what's the word background origins what kind yeah. of theories we use in our work what approaches we use what methods we use what um, the objects of study are as well that we actually <laughs> engage with in media um, and then we're going to do a little bit of kind of group work on some scenarios the research that you guys can go with thinking about how you might go and do your own yeah. Just before we go any further, do you want to, should we have everyone introduce yes, themselves? that's a good idea actually. Yeah, Starting with Fiona. Um, I'm Fiona, I'm secondary journalism, and I have the late Fiona and Rogers, that's what I came today. And uh, hello everyone. <laughs> 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 Hi, I'm Liana, I'm sitting here in the broadcast in the studio. Mm -hmm. And my supervisor is actually a lady in the You just want a good mark, don't you? I've only I haven't even been at this university for a year yet. I've not even been here for one year. <laughs> yeah, some of the other students in your group should have remembered this. You should remember this one. Yeah. Okay. I'm Aaron, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, <laughs> um, Hi, Aaron. I'm uh, um, a first year television and digital media um, student. Uh, Is it that bad that you don't remember <laughs> what degree you're on? No, it's <laughs> really bad memory. Um, yeah. Welcome. Hi, I'm Lily. Um, I'm in first year doing joint ones with mediums. Thank you for coming. Uh, as you can see, we have such a such a full room. The camera can't see it, so that's what they, that's what they do. Um, that's why they do in Parliament because um, it's all just recorded, written down. So that's why they always say there's an amazing turnout today. Uh, when there's oh, there's like four people. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, do you want to go first, or you want me to? Oh, you go first. Okay. I want to um, find out what you do. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Okay. Um, <laughs> I prepared a few slides. Just a couple. Um, so basically, I am broadly speaking a cultural historian, but most of my work ends up focusing on American popular culture and Hollywood cinema. Um, so this is to do with my PhD research. So my PhD was on John Hughes, um, he used to go on, yeah. Um, and it was looking at his career, because he was a writer, director, producer. And I was also looking at uh, 1980s and 1990s Hollywood. So looking at the film industry and looking at the films themselves. So some of the things I looked at were things like um, he did a cycle of teen movies. So The Breakfast Club, Pretty in Pink, uh, Some Kind of Wonderful, Weird Pretty Science, Day Off. Pretty in Day Off, etc. Um, so looking at things like tie-in soundtracks um, and looking at how the kind of relationship between record industry MTV and the Hollywood studios was developing in the 1980s and how that kind of influenced production trends and how films were made as well. Because um, a lot of these movies have these sequences that are basically just music videos. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I was doing. Um, also looking at the impact of VHS, which for you guys is something that's probably quite foreign to a lot of you. Um, but certainly for my age group, was something that kind of was a very big thing growing up. Um, and so I had a huge impact on the film industry, um, enormous. Um, it kind of went from in the 70s, beginning of the 70s, where most of the money in America um, was uh, from, from a film release was, was box office. Um, it was kind of by the end of the 80s, like 30%, and the rest was things like cable, TV, VHS, etc. Um, so looking at kind of researching video releases, how they were promoted, um, there were always kind of exploitation style marketing things, so video stores were fairly free to what they wanted, so kind of, um, there was one where they did for 16 Candles where they did a competition and then there was like a birthday cake that they iced with the video design and stuff. Um, that kind of thing, so that was quite cool. Um, and then I also looked at kind of his family films, so he wrote Home Alone, Home Alone 2, uh, Dennis and Manus, Miracle on 34th Street, all those kind of films from that period. So also thinking about what kind of tie-ins 
uh, and ancillary products that were linked to these movies. So kind of Disney were the first ones to really start doing that in the late 80s, but you find there's a whole kind of cycle of movies where they try and figure out ways they can make more money, basically, from synergies with video games and toys and stuff. Um, and there was a huge controversy actually around uh, this thing, which is, it's kind of like a Walkman, but you can record using it, so a bit like a dictaphone. Um, and basically, um, the movie producers liaised with a toy company and came up with this product before they made the movie. And then it's written right into like the script of the film. It's like a key kind of plot device. So you get Macaulay Culkin's character using it at various points in the film, and there's all these kind of close-up shots of the toy. Uh, and this caused massive uproar basically because uh, people were saying that parents, you know, um, were being pestered um, for these talk boy cassette players, which were like quite expensive at the time, sort of fifty dollars plus. Um, was the top-selling Christmas toy for several years actually. Toy. So it worked, um, but obviously quite controversial um, using that kind of way of embedding marketing into the films. Um, and in terms of method, um, a lot of my research uses primary materials from the time, so historical stuff. So um, the big kind of sources I was using were loads, but variety was kind of one of my go to things for looking at the US film industry. Uh, likewise, Hollywood Reporter as well, so where you get a lot of the information around, you know who's signing deals with who, um, what films are going to be made, what kind of wider production trends are going on, etc. So like once Home Alone is successful, you get like a ton of studios um, basically green lighting kind of family films to try and make uh, more money. Um, also stuff like the New York Times as well. I look at a lot of newspapers in my work because um, they're a really good resource for kind of situating Films, events, uh, kind of broader cultural concerns as well. So around like the family film, there's a lot of anxiety around violence. Um, if you've seen Home Alone, it's like guys getting smacked in the face with paint cans and stuff. Mm. So um, again, parents not very happy about that at the time. Uh, so looking at that, looking at responses in, in, in New York Times, LA Times, etc. Thinking about that. So that was kind of what my PhD was about. It's going to be turned into a book. Nearly got a publisher sorted, which is exciting. So that'll be coming out in a year or two. Um, so other examples of stuff that I do, that I write about, um, I've got chapters coming out soon on Macaulay Culkin and child stardom. So again, thinking about uh, Hollywood and kind of the broader uh, kind of media celebrity that surrounded Macaulay Culkin and the kind of economic and cultural things that made that possible, uh, and his friendship with Michael Jackson as well which sort of shaped a lot of, how, of kind of how he's written about, basically, in the media. He ended up kind of, Michael Jackson ended up kind of being a warning of what could happen to Macaulay Culkin if people didn't sort of start to tell him to behave himself, basically. Um, also, a colleague from the University of Huddersfield, who is a sports historian, I'm a, a kind of an expert on wrestling. Um, he and I have written a, an article about Hulk Hogan and his uh, family films in the 90s, which I just... One of those moments where you have a bonkers crossover between kind of wrestling, which was really expanding at that time, um, and New Line Pictures, uh, which were kind of an independent film company that really benefited from video, and they just made these films with Hulk Hogan that now seem <coughs> ridiculous, but at the time made perfect uh, sense, both sort of commercially and culturally. Uh, so we look at those, and it's kind of a bit bonkers. Uh, and then I'm kind of moving on now to looking. Um, more at kind of this idea more broadly of family entertainment so not just in Hollywood but uh, family entertainment is something that's used in kind of the video games industry it's used um, in relation to things like McDonald's it's used uh, increasingly in the 90s places like Walmart and stuff have loads of like family events family fun days it's all very much sort of shaped by corporate concerns and kind of issues around things like the privatisation of, of kind of spaces of corporatisation of childhood, etc. So that's kind of what I research. Um, and just to kind of situate that in a kind of intellectual tradition. Basically, um, as I've said, I'm a historian. So uh, a lot of my thinking is kind of shaped by what's happened in the last sort of 10 to 20 years <coughs> in film studies. Uh, you kind of get what people call the historical turn. So more and more people thinking actually we need to go, rather than just watching films, which was what film studies was for a really long time, we actually need to go and we need to look at, at 
primary materials at newspapers, at the trade press, and all these other kinds of evidence, posters, etc. So yeah, so we have kind of new film history, new cinema history, uh, as it's known. Um, related to this as well, things like media archaeology, um, convergence media history, which are kind of uh, great ways of thinking about things in a much more connected way uh, as well. So that's kind of where I'm coming from uh, intellectually. The other kind of stuff that I use, obviously, in addition to all those primary materials, is I read a lot of other books as well. So um, there's a wealth of stuff on Hollywood cinema as an industry and as kind of a, a way of you know, creating culture. Um, there's also elements of kind of childhood studies and cultural studies in what I do uh, as well. So yeah, I pull together basically like a lot of different threads in media, cultural and film studies and hopefully create something that's a bit more holistic. So yeah, so that's what I do. I'm going to hand over to my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Evans. Well, that's esteemed of you, because you do much more interesting stuff for me. So Holly's taken time and effort to do something <laughs> today, and I've done nothing of the sort <laughs> whatsoever, because back in the summer, I took time and effort to put together these two paragraphs of writing. And I figured, well... Holly's good with the pictures and so on. So kind of quite ironic thing that just happened. I just had an email off Juicy Parika. Oh, really? Just to see what him up on <laughs> yeah, the screen. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Holly's form of media research is extremely different to mine. And I think that's the first thing I should say. However, we are both reputable media researchers. Holly more reputable than me, I suspect. My research background is in the philosophy of technology and new media. Okay, so I'll just break that up a little bit. Philosophy of technology is really my research area. I am a philosopher of technology. Now, some people in philosophy would look at me and think, you're not really a philosopher anymore. Uh, because I don't engage in philosophical arguments anymore. What I do is adapt philosophical arguments to explain phenomena that's emergent in new media. What the hell are you talking about, philosophy of technology? Well, my basis in the philosophy of technology is the idea that um, technologies have a fundamental role in <coughs> shaping the way we are consciously aware of the world around us. So our exposure to and our ability to use technologies to interact with the world as a form of prothesis that brings us into the world fundamentally affects the way we understand the world. Okay, very straightforward when you put it in those terms. I do. Natural transformation of phenomena into data through digital technologies. I'm interested in how the world is transformed into digital technology and how therefore we see the world through that digital technology. Unsurprisingly, the primary focus of my research has been on the mobile phone because that's the primary way that we do this. The notion that everyone stares into their phones all day is a very real notion for me. But this journey takes you through a number of interesting parts. <coughs> so I've got a whole bunch of stuff up on my website here, or up on the university website, about things that I've written over the past. But this is possibly the most interesting place to begin. I wrote a small article. It was the first thing I ever had published and was the inspiration for the tattoo I have on my wrist. Because it was actually the first thing I ever had published. And I thought, I'm going to commemorate this in some way. So I had a, tattoo, I had a quote from it <coughs> tattooed on my wrist. Yeah. Um, in a, a very particular stylistic way. That article was written when I was a master's student. Uh, and it's about how the Man of Street Preachers interpret Frederick Nietzsche, the philosopher. Okay, so my background in philosophy allowed me to sort of branch into media and say how is philosophy interpreted in these ways. And if you like, everything after that is kind of an extension of how philosophical ideas can be translated via new media into making them more understandable. So, as I've moved it, and I can even go back even further and show you this. The first academic conference I ever spoke at, my paper out was called What Value Attaches to a Restored Landscape? I was actually, back then, an environmental ethicist. I had nothing to do with media whatsoever. I was a deep philosophical guy. Uh, I was you know, I was, my primary interest was in environmental ethics. So media came sort of after. Media is 
after the philosophical part of me, which puts me in a slightly different position to people like Holly, who, Holly obviously is a historian, but media is a critical function within that history as well, and it, the object of Holly's study is the media part of it. The object of my study is the philosophical aspect very often, which interestingly moves me away from the media and onto the human responses to the media. So it's centered very much around ideas and reflections and what we call phenomenology, the experience of the world and the everyday experience of the world, um, which is a very different approach to media. No less uh, important approach to media, but a very different one altogether. So, for example, I get invited to do talks. I don't have many because I'm not that important. But talks that I have been invited to do. I've been invited to do talks about political economy of social media, for example, where that talk was about what social media or mobile social media use means for people, how we are packaged up, how we are bought, how we are sold, and how that affects the way we see the world. I've done a talk on self-tracking cultures in Liverpool, where the focus was on this notion of hybrid beings, how we're being transformed into both human and non-human beings all the time by our use of media. In the one about smart cities, I was talking about privacy, but what that means to be private actually what it means for me if I know everything is being collected about me at all points of the day how exactly am I a private person because I still am but what I, how do I unpick that what things about me are private and how therefore do we privilege those things about being private if there's no such thing as private space anymore and as you can see I've got a wide and varied and kind of bizarre sort of thing going on with publications over my career if I bring it up to 2015 and 2016, much of my research work, which you can go onto the website and read, it's all hyperlinked, you know, just click away and read and enjoy yourself. Um, yeah, do that, but don't expect to get anything from it. Okay? A lot of my things here, I mean, four square is a particular thing that you can see being repeated across things here. Four square, it just, do you know what four square is? What is it? Or you can say where you are. Yeah. Is, is more is more what it is. It's um, a location-based social network where you literally say, "I am here. I check in here." Uh, so based on my PhD, so like Holly, I've transformed my PhD into other sort of research papers and so on. And based on my PhD. I've got a few different papers out right here about mood and orientation towards computational objects. That's based on my Foursquare research. This is a kind of bizarre one, and no one ever picked up on this. There's a pun in the title of this, of this paper. Star what is Wars. it? It's the, thank you. Sorry. Nobody ever picked up that that's a pun on Star Wars. A New Hope, Star Wars Episode Four. No one ever did that. But it's a, that's actually a piece of practical research in a research project I was involved in in Wales, where we were paid by... Um, who were we paid by for that? Action for Hearing Loss. Yeah. Who gave us a bunch of money to go out and find out what was the effect of switching from analog television to digital television for deaf audiences in Wales. So we did a longitudinal study with 250 people. Uh, where we went. I did the original primary research where I went around Wales interviewing people, about 30 different people, who had varying degrees of hearing loss. Uh, then we did a, um, a long form survey with about 270 re replies, which gave us a solid, solid foundation of data so we can make our conclusions. And what we actually found is that all the problems that digital television was supposed to solve for hard of hearing people, it didn't solve any of them because it just replaced them with a new bunch of problems of how do you actually interact with the technology and how do you get it to work, because they've never been given any information on that. So it was an interesting piece of research and it's out there. And then the rest is up again, Foursquare and technological memory, so I'm interested in how uh, social media use alters our perceptions of time and how we come to rely on it to recant the past. Um, how s social media affects play, how we do what we call data-driven computer experiments, how we mess around with people's movements, and how we can use people's movements. What a data-driven computing experiment is, is a kind of thought experiment. We say, well, we know where people are because they tell us on locative social media. How can we get them to do things? 
how can we get at, so Amazon, for example, are looking into, if we know where people check in all the time, could they deliver packages for us? Because we know where they're going. And this sort of thing. So that's a paper all about how big data organisations look at this information and try to assess how they can use people in particular ways, which is a bit frightening. Locative media and identity is a very important part of my work, so again, how we use the idea of where we are as a form of social capital to say who we are. So, for example, I'd never check into McDonald's because I don't want people to think I'm the sort of person that eats at McDonald's, you know? You are, though. I'm sure. I to totally am, yeah, of course. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't want people to know that about me, right? I don't want that to be out there. I want them to think I eat in KFC because I'm so much class at McDonald's. <laughs> And just like Holly, my PhD was transformed into this book, and part of it will appear in this book, which should come out in March as well. But I think the main differences between us are, although we're both media theorists and both media scholars, I concentrate on the human aspect of media rather than the media aspect of media. So within that, there are different methods that we do. My research is very much based on interviews, very much based on questionnaires, very much based on human assumptions and human impressions of how we use media. That means, that's a fairly decent explanation of media research there because some researchers will look at the media, mm. and of course you also deal with humans as well. Yeah. And I also have to deal with media as well, I have to deal with the concrete realities of what digital media is and so on and so forth, but the primary focus is slightly different for us. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say as well, yours is kind of much more in a social science yes, tradition. Yes, absolutely. Whereas what I do is much more in a kind of humanities and arts tradition of scholarship, which, yeah, in the forms of efforts to life, you would never really do kind of, yeah, questionnaires and maybe would do interviews, but not with participants or anything like you would, that. You would interview the actual experts, experts. You would yeah, interview, yeah. who were in the film, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning is that a lot of Leighton's research has been funded projects. What I do doesn't <laughs> Um, so if you if you have dreams or aspirations of writing about popular culture, um, chances are you're going to pay for you to do that. Um, yeah, unless you get a job at university. Everything from up here um, is, was all funded by the European Research Council when I was working in Ireland. Yeah, so. And now we've left Europe, so who knows? And now we've left well, Europe, and I can't go and work in Ireland anymore. So yeah, I'm screwed for money. Woo! Uh, but yeah, that's what I to say. It's really late. It's kind of, and also yeah, you're very cutting edge. And part, I suppose, of what you have to do is keep up with stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas so I have next the paper is on Pokemon Go, for example. <laughs> yeah, I have the luxury basically of going history. In the past now, I can kind of, you know, obviously the present really affects how I think about the past, for sure, and what was interesting to people, but it doesn't change, <laughs> it's kind of there, <laughs> uh, which for me is nice. Um, my only concern really is, yeah, that other people will get there first, which they don't. I spent a lot of time at the start of my PhD worrying that other people are going to research the same things. Turns out, no one really cares, um, so that's fun. Um, we all care. Yeah, what I mean is no one cares enough to go through no one cares enough to do sweat it 10, 15 years worth of Billboard magazine and kind of find video and data releases and stuff, uh, video. data on video releases and stuff like that, like I've spent hours and hours and hours on microfilm as well, okay, because a lot of stuff hasn't been digitised, this is the other thing I say to students and they don't realise, is like you assume now, like everything you can find on a computer, no, there's loads of stuff where you go to an archive and then there's a woman that just walks in the room and goes and drops a big box of stuff that hasn't been sorted. And that would be the point I lead. <laughs> that's, yeah. just, that's just not happening. And then you hear <laughs> stories, apparently there are archives where there's like a woman with a teacher on it and stuff, but I've never been to any of them. I've only I'm been to like the British Library where there are fascists about everything and you have to kind of, you can't take anything in and then check inside your iPad cover and stuff. It's all quite, yeah. Are. But uh, yeah, I think we, 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 we yeah. still communicate, we speak the same language. We do, certain we do. Things. but we, I mean, we, we look at different aspects of the, you know, what media is. And we also look at in different ways temporarily at things mm. as well. Mm. Holly, if you like, the direction is backwards, my direction is to a certain extent forwards. Yeah. And I'm trying yeah. to make some kind of predictions of where things will be heading with regards yeah. to social media use. It's very dangerous to make predictions, yeah. so I try not to make them too much, but that's an inevitable consequence of what you do, unfortunately. And I think media archaeology is probably actually one of those areas where our work does overlap, so part yeah. of what I'm doing by going into the past is looking how we 
how we got to where we are. Um, and, and media archaeology does that because it's basically about going, well, X doesn't necessarily follow, you know, things don't necessarily follow in a logical way. They could have gone in any direction. Um, and then, yeah. And funny enough, I use media, kind of media archaeology to go forward. forwards. Yeah. Get exactly, so, the same, yeah. sort of, exactly the same method of using it. Yeah. It's just the way we're trying to use it is almost in a different direction. Yeah. So you've probably, they've probably heard enough from us. Yeah, they want to hear about us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, we're going to now, hopefully, 